Sony Interactive Entertainment London Studio. Notable for the PlayStation Home Service, SingStar, iToy, and most recently a couple of VR exclusives including Blood and Truth. Formed in 2002, it was merged with two other Sony-based studios, one who was an internal developer for Cynosis and Team Soho, who made a few sports and racing games for the PS1 that I should have reviewed by now, including This Is Football, NBA Shootout, Rapid Racer, and Porsche Challenge. With the latter, the design team were given assistance by Porsche employees to recreate the Boxster, including the interior as accurately as possible, and motion capture the characters, which set the tone for their next big project. Comprised of multiple developers of Sony subsidiaries all over the UK, including Brendan McNamara, it was first conceived as a spiritual successor. But after the release of Driver, which had driving-based missions on free-roaming maps, McNamara decided he wanted to do something like that instead. And with the release of the PlayStation 2 nearby, they were given a development kit, which they used to recreate Piccadilly Circus as accurately as possible. The original premise for this game was a getaway driver for hire on different and robberies around the world, inspired by the Italian job. But when another driving game called Metropolis Street Racer came onto the spotlight, recreating expanded real-life city layouts including London, the developers decided to expand theirs, which created a chain reaction of how this will look and how that will look, character models, animations, all done by motion capture as well. The Getaway was released for the PlayStation 2 in Europe on December 2002 and North America the next month. Two years after, it was initially planned to be a launch title for the system as they completely underestimated how ridiculous of a project it was. Although it received polarizing reviews for its unconventional gameplay when it was new, it was successful commercially, selling 3.5 million copies worldwide, and retrospective views have been more positive over the last few years for the same reason, and is now considered a cult classic, requested by you guys for years, and is the most voted game on this month's Patreon suggestion thread. Rise and shine, Marky boy. You got work to do. Mark Hammond has just been released from prison for armed robbery and decided to move on from the gang life in London. However, a couple of months later, his wife Susie was walking her son Alex to school. They're surrounded by members of the Bethnal Green gang who intend to kidnap them both. The brief struggle resulted in Susie getting shot and Alex taken away. A horrified Mark finds his wife barely alive and she makes him promise to save Alex before dying in her arms. Unfortunately, because Mark was the first to be witnessed at the scene with the murder weapon, he's targeted as the suspect as he angrily chases after the real killers. He was able to reach a warehouse and see his son just before being knocked out. And after he gains consciousness, mob boss Charlie Jolston orders Mark to play a game. A bit like Simon says, only he does what Charlie says. You want to see your kid alive? You do exactly what I say. You talk to anyone, you're late, or you let me down. Your kid dies. Do I make myself clear? With no other choice and nothing else to lose, he reluctantly agrees by basically causing utter chaos in London, hitting all the gangs in the city centre hard, including the ones he used to work with, and taking out rival figures, police officers, putting all the gangs on the brink of a war. Basically, Mark is put in an impossible situation, but if he wants to see Alex again and clear his name, he has to cooperate. You're in deep now, son. Very deep. You're gonna have to play very rough if you don't want to get out and see the boy. Unless there's another way. Meanwhile, Frank Carter, who's investigating the Bethnal Green mob, is in the thick of a lot of Mark's shenanigans, always coming under fire by Chief McCormack despite essentially defusing the situations and taking the fall because the operation stinks. Therefore, he goes into vigilante mode and uncovers a lot more than meets the eye. I'm gonna bust every place on this list and I'm gonna start right here. Now, before I even started playing the game, what I like about the premise is right from the first cutscene, it provides a very strong feeling of vulnerability. Mark is falsely accused for the murder of his wife, his son kidnapped, and forced to complete tasks even against his former gang, with barely, if anyone to trust, and even the tiniest slip up, the kid dies. That is really bold stuff right there, and that's what makes Charlie Jolston a pretty good villain. He has a strong influence over everyone, not just Hammond. I know it sounds cliche saying that, but it's True. Don't be silly, boy. Think what could happen to your little Alex. You're in no position to play around. I ain't messing around, Charlie. Oh. 
The rest of the characters, not really. Not even Hammond is that memorable. I honestly rate Frank Carter ahead of him. Maybe because it's satisfying watching him talk back to his chief almost every cutscene. You put too many lives at risk, including my own. It doesn't help that the game starts off with a bang. You think the use of motion capture, which I'll get to, would have meant more backstory for extra character development? I don't know why I think that, because it's very well acted, the ending, cheesy but still epic, and it has plenty of storyline structures that would be used for another one of McNamara's games, Ellie Noir, almost a decade later. Police corruption, two playable protagonists with their own branches, and while nowhere near as confusing as its spiritual successor, it's not as predictable as you might think. Think. Though I reckon it would have made the characters more likeable and the two main protagonists interactions more meaningful if everything played out in chronological order. Maybe it's because I haven't seen many of the movies it takes a lot of inspiration from, including Get Carter, Snatch and Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels to understand, which I have to admit I'm a bit ashamed of myself for. It certainly looks authentic enough, right up to the accents, the opening credits and the cover. A cover that really makes it clear that I should be respecting the rating classification. I'm out! Make the boy listen! Anyway, the best part of the story is the way it presents itself cinematically, which as we established is what the developers worked the hardest on. Because for a PlayStation 2 exclusive from 2002, it's astonishing. What a showcase of what the system can do when telling a story. For the cutscenes and gameplay, it uses motion capture for both facial animations and performances from the actors that provide the voices for the characters, all being generated at the same time. Even the fingers are captured and facial models look like they're talking. The camera aren't fixed on one shot and when they're hurt in story they have a few bumps and bruises. When I saw the making of this game, I saw glimpses of what the developers would do with Ellie Noir almost a decade later, but back in the early 2000s this would have been unprecedented. London is multicultural. It always was. Only people like you never realised it. And I haven't even mentioned the photorealistic, super accurate recapturing of London with its street placement, iconic landmarks, and 30 official car manufacturers. It also runs surprisingly smooth, at least to a level where it doesn't hinder the gameplay. It's only really noticeable during cutscenes. Unlike GTA 3 or Vice City, the game doesn't stop to load another area nor building. Even these are part of the whole map, and you have plenty of graphical options, including a choice between PAL and NTSC output regardless of region. A progressive scan mode which requires a scar cable that I don't have yet, and a proper native widescreen option that actually extends the screen properly unlike most PS2 games. It wouldn't surprise me if there's a hidden HDMI option somewhere in the menu. If you're going by graphics alone, the getaway is up there with Shadow of the Colossus, God of War, Gran Turismo 4, you know, top 5 for best looking PlayStation 2 exclusives. It looks incredible. Give that to you. If I'm gonna go, I might as well top myself. It's obviously not grand and epic in scale compared to those games. You're not exactly taking on a Godzilla-sized Charlie in the middle of Piccadilly Circus, but you can see and feel the length the developers went to recreate the streets of London. They certainly benefited from having their studio a part of Sony Computer Entertainment in the middle of the city. And looking at everything today, it's aged really well compared to similar open world titles from the early 2000s. The only real criticism I have with the map is that trying to make it so realistic means there isn't much personality to it. Just a couple of spots to act as headquarters to break the status quo, but otherwise it's just the same vehicle type, civilians, nothing changes apart from the road placement. It's the kind of map that you can use in any video game franchise. But then again, when you think of video games set in a modern London, the getaway is one of the first that come to mind. <laughs> But how does it affect the gameplay? Well, you might notice there's no dashboard, and this isn't something you have a choice in. According to the developers, it was another way to further add to the cinematic look. But what I like most is how it makes the map feel bigger. Now, I've never been to London before, but I do know that it's huge. And for the first few hours, it's like you're driving through the whole thing. Therefore, using alternative methods to navigate your way through the story, whether it's on foot or in a vehicle, which honestly felt like an eternity to explain in the way I'm about to right now. 
now. Like any distinctive open world game, all vehicles can be entered via stolen or provided, but instead of a waypoint, they have working turn signals which give you a rough idea of where to go next, kind of like Burnout. However, what you're looking at is the first minute of my playthrough, driving around, a timer going off that I didn't know was exactly that, and mission failed. Right from the first minute, I had to look up manuals and walkthroughs to understand what was going on, and even by the time I reached the end, I only had a vague idea of where I was. The game doesn't do a good enough job creating these alternative methods. For example, there's one mission where you're meant to tail someone, and for me, it took over half an hour just to figure out what the car looked like. I love you. You're mine now. On top of that, cars also slide very easily and are incredibly sensitive. Like you have to treat them as if you're driving through London in real life. Since one small bump causes the car to veer either left or right, too much damage slows the car to walking speed, and further damage sets it on fire, killing you instantly. There was one occasion where I had to swap four different cars en route to a destination because each one kept breaking down. And it's not like I was being deliberately reckless. The way the missions are set up, there isn't anything else to do. It's my linear so I was trying my best to stay alive but even your best efforts aren't always going to be enough because there's at least one enemy gang vehicle and or policeman trying to kill you which makes being on the road feel like being punched in the face every five seconds non-stop until you reach your destination because you have absolutely no way to defend yourself while driving and did I mention you're on a time limit half the playthrough fortunately when you control Frank a police officer it makes life a little bit easier since there's only one enemy type to worry about, and when you arrive at a checkpoint and just happen to get killed by an enemy, you respawn at the spot you just arrived at, and nor are they on your tail anymore. I'm only pointing that out because it happened to me more than once. And considering where the rest of the checkpoints are set, this feels like the only saving grace. The only thing you ever do when you walk into a room is take out enemies to reach the checkpoint with different weapons and a limited amount of health. Just like any typical shooting game, some levels you need to keep quiet, dodge the occasional cargo and security lasers, probably my favourite the latter. The actual level design is pretty good. You pick up your weapons dropped by enemies with some of them you can dual wield. You can either lock on or aim manually, take cover. It all sounds straightforward, right? This is too easy. But similar to driving a vehicle, there's no HUD. So the amount of health is determined by the speed of your movement, limping helplessly, and to regenerate it back you need to lean on a wall to catch your breath. You can only carry one weapon that isn't a pistol, ammo numbers are non-existent. I can see on screen where the developers were going with this, how it appears to have none of the video video game cliches. But the downside is, like the driving, you have to know everything from the beginning all by yourself. You literally walk into your first firefight taking on over a dozen enemies at every corner without a clue of even how to move on two legs. Okay, if you pause it, there'll be one tip explaining how the controls work and changes every time you keep pausing it. But at this stage with everything else I've talked about, my recommendation is to read the manual before you even switch on the PlayStation 2. And even when you do eventually comprehend how the mechanics work, it's still no fun. Firstly, the time it takes to regenerate health is so long it needs to be played to be believed. Whenever you're indoors, you move so slowly that the role used for dodging gunfire, using that repeatedly makes you move faster. The right analog stick isn't used at all. It literally does nothing. Therefore, the camera is always trying to lock forwards. It's all over the place, increasing the chance of being blindsided by enemies. Look at the way I've positioned hands and there's no other way. In fact, some enemies will charge straight at you for taking cover because you're hidden, and no matter how early you draw, they'll always find ways to tag you too. Did I mention how long it takes to regenerate health? Seems like coppers are more in danger from McCormack these days than they are from the villains. And speaking of that, there are a couple of enemies that can take multiple bullets without any way of telling. This one in particular simply refused to die after 10 minutes of walking back and forth because of the slow regenerating health, until I realized you need to make him leave the room for the police to take him down themselves. This hospital level puts everything I don't like about this game into one. And if you decide to quit out of frustration, which is very easy to do, reload the game back up again. You have to redo the entire chapter and rewatch the long, unskippable cutscene all over again. So think before you quit. He's out of order. He should learn some manners. 
Now I have to keep in mind that the developers were making the getaway during the PlayStation 1 years, before Grand Theft Auto became a step ahead of everyone else, and even before the right analog stick would become a prominent use of movement in any 3D video game. I mean think about it, Grand Theft Auto 3 hasn't aged all that well either. The gameplay mechanics are actually very similar to the getaway, but without a cover system, and there are occasions where I had to pick enemies off from a distance to avoid instant death from certain blind spots. The construction area, perfect case in point. But even these methods felt less tedious than the ones in the getaway, because the gameplay in GTA 3 is more exciting, especially when you're not in a mission. It has more to offer, and is easier to pick up and play. The getaway feels slower, clunkier, and a lot more luck and trial and error based. When you resort to shoot, take cover in a safe spot back and forth literally every minute in almost every single mission, then that's when you know they botched the controls. Not just on foot, but when driving as well. Maybe this is why the story didn't keep me engaged. My mind was so occupied on crawling my way through with broken fingernails. I'm out of rounds! It's a shame. I really wanted to like this game for its unusual style, because the things that are good about it are really good. The British gangster movie inspiration, the map of London, amazing graphics that are still impressive to look at today, and even the drawbacks are presented in a positive way. When health is low, if you're walking upstairs, you move slower. Dialogue is unique for certain missions, like when you restart, you'll say something different. Little details like that illustrate effort. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's a video game. And as a video game, if I'm playing it going absolutely mental the second I'm controlling that alpha, then it's the kind of unconventional gameplay that hasn't caught on. Like literally the whole time I was either controlling Mark or Frank, I wasn't enjoying it. Now I'm sure there are plenty of people who like the idea of figuring things out themselves to that level. There's a good reason why it's gotten a cult following over the last few years, but there's also a good reason why it was so polarizing in 2002. Like driving a car that's on the verge of completely falling apart 90% of the time, the low checkpoint count, clunky controls, it's the gameplay. I'm not saying they shouldn't have got rid of the HUD, but they should have done a better job of compensating in other areas and taken some liberties. Make the cutscenes skippable, allow the cars to take more punishment, reduce the time it takes to regenerate health, and have the ability to sprint indoors. Maybe it's because the developers spent ages designing the city of London, they didn't have time to work on refining the rest of the game. It came out two years after it was originally meant to be released, after all. They Getaway certainly leaves a lot of what ifs on the table. The least I can do is respect the fact they will try new things, which isn't as common in AAA games these days, and it definitely deserves a proper sequel or remake. Why not? Imagine what a British gangster themed open world game set in London would look like on the PlayStation 5 after years of the genre evolving. I know there's another PS2 sequel called Black Monday which came out in 2004, but I'll talk about that in the future. You definitely don't want to know about this one. But otherwise, if you're still curious and want to try out The Getaway, then take this review as a way of saying just be careful, and read the manual first before entering the abyss that is the City of London.